Welcome to episode 158 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Please visit hankgarner.com and check out the show notes uh, of the show. There's lots of great stuff there. You can also subscribe to the show and dig through all of the archives. Uh, There's so much writerly goodness there. I don't even uh, know where to tell you to begin. Go back to the beginning and listen all the way forward. Uh, I know there's going to be some uh, something there that really motivates you, resonates with you, or maybe you learn something new about your favorite author. And we've got some great sponsors this week. Uh, Tales from the Canyons of the Damned. Uh, my good friend Daniel Arthur Smith is the helmsman of this fantastic series. And uh, their latest one is uh, Canyons of the Damned in Space, uh, the second edition. Uh, just came out some fantastic stories there some of the best cover art uh, in publishing right now go pick it up and you know what order the uh, the paperbacks because these are absolutely collectible editions I hope you'll go pick those up and let Daniel know that I sent you uh, I also saw Daniel mention today that they have a Valentine's uh, Tales from the Canyons of the Damned coming up cannot wait to read those pulpy goodness stories just for Valentine's Day uh, also, I'll be continuing my uh, my story thread for Crossroads coming up soon, so be sure to check those out. Also, Nick Cole brings us Fight the Rooster. Fight the Rooster's challenger for best read of the year. Well worth a look. An amazing job, says Tim Ward. Hugo-nominated reviewer and host of the Sci-Fi Podcast. Uh, Fight the Rooster is a little departure for Nick. It's uh, kind of a dark Hollywood story, so go check it out. Fight the Rooster by Nick Cole. Uh, link in the show notes. Also, my good friends at thirdscribe.com want to remind you that if you are an author and you need a platform, of course you need a platform. Uh, but if you need help with your platform, go visit Rob and the good folks at thirdscribe.com. They will help you get started. If you're a reader and you want to know more about some of your favorite authors, go sign up at Thirdscribe. It's a place where readers and writers connect in a really cool and novel new way. I told Rob recently that I'm going to start uh, doing some of my personal blogging over at Third Scribe. Uh, I host the podcast here at HankGarner.com, but uh, I really want to do some kind of off-the-cuff writing, and I'm going to do some of that over at Third Scribe. So uh, go check them out, ThirdScribe.com. Also, Eric Totsi uh, this week brings us The Scout, and if you'll listen for just a second, he's going to tell you all about it. Also, don't forget audible.com. Audibletrial.com slash Hank lets you sign up for free and get a free audiobook. Thank you for listening. Change is inevitable. It's heading for Earth at 12,000 miles per hour, and it will land virtually undetected. For Jack McAllister, a young writer who has finally launched a career for himself, it begins tragically. His estranged father, a former NASA engineer, dies suddenly at his home in Meriwether, Indiana, leaving Jack's Alzheimer-stricken mother a widow. But in the wake of personal heartbreak, he's confronted by an even more astonishing event, the covert landing of an alien machine in the forest just a few miles outside of town. Now Jack must unmask the true purpose of the otherworldly device that has begun a detailed environmental survey of the woods. Aided by the town's young and resilient female deputy sheriff, he soon discovers that the alien scout is only one small part of a much larger operation, and the countdown to a terrifying global catastrophe is about to take place. Drawing deeply from his father's scientific influence, Jack uncovers, and ultimately finds himself an unwilling component of, an alien plan set to terminate life on Earth as we know it. Crichton-esque techno-thriller with enough twists and turns to keep you turning those pages. The rural setting and the believable character set this apart from the majority of alien invasion novels. Sci-Fi365.net The Scout by Eric Totsi, now available at Amazon.com Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. I'm very excited today to have a a good friend of mine, uh, John Freighter, on the show. And uh, John is one of those guys that I met on Facebook 
couple of years ago and uh and we've been involved in some uh projects together and uh I am a big fan of John's work so uh you know the the requirement to be a guest on author stories is I have to be a fan of your work and uh I was super excited that John agreed to come on the show this week so uh welcome to the show John Thank you very much for having me Hank so, John, you uh, you know the the question I start with, and right. that is, uh, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer and or storyteller? Um, we I've always been sort of a storyteller. It started when we, my brother and I, were kids. Um, we would find interesting things that we saw. The, the Carol Burnett show was really big back in the uh, in the seventies, and oh, yeah. yeah, Tim Conway and Harvey Corman did these awesome things, and we were just really in that space. And so we would we would basically put on our variants of these things for our parents who thought this was the bomb. This was a big deal because when you're seven, it's not it's easy it's easy to um to impress your parents with your seven um and that that's probably where it started um it got weirder and more complicated and more ambitious as time went on um i started um i, I actually did not want to be a writer to start with writing just came easily to me where where other things i wanted to do like graphic art and mathematics did not um and so i just went with um the uh, what's it called the path of least resistance and in college i i was doing really well and um i got to be the uh, contributor to and later on the uh the um, editor in chief of the college literary magazine for two years. Um, at a similar time, I was working with some college friends on a gaming magazine called Gateways, uh, where I was reviewing um, gaming um, gaming materials and uh, and writing articles on uh, bits and pieces with that. And when that finally turned into something uh, interesting, is actually that's how I met uh, Kevin Sambito, who was the um, publisher at um, at Palladium Books, uh, who was doing all kinds of. Of, uh, of interesting things um they had the, the palladium role-playing game they had the palladium you know they had uh the beyond the supernatural which was their horror thing and i wrote a couple of books for their uh, robotech line of, uh, of rpgs and so after that it uh, just got you know and then i it, it gets complicated after that but that's basically where it started <laughs> that's awesome uh so as a kid uh what sorts of fiction uh intrigued you I was always a science fiction geek. I always want. Okay. I wanted to write Star Trek stories and Space nineteen ninety nine stories, um, but I didn't know how. <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, right. I, I had the I had the, uh, the, the ambition to be something interesting, but I didn't really have the skills yet. Um, so what I would do is memorize conversations from these shows, put them down on paper, and then come up with my own additions and uh, and, and alternate um, storylines to them. So that's, you know, it, it, fan fiction, basically. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, I was writing Robotech fanfic before there was such a thing as Robotech fanfic. It's actually <laughs> pretty funny. When you I think, think a lot – a lot of us kids that uh, that grew up in the seventies uh, had this. Uh, there, there was a lot of influential science fiction uh, that came out of that era. Uh, you look back on it now; some of it was was really great and and withstands the test of time. Some of it, not so much. Uh, but that really was a great time to be a kid, you know. I think so. Uh um, back then, you can still find independent bookstores pretty much all, all over the place. Even the places, even the chain places, uh, Brentano's. We uh, had a Brentano's a few uh, a few blocks from our house. And one of the best things about going to the newly opened Queen Center Mall, which was you know in, in uh, my neighborhood, uh, was the fact that there was this store that had so many shelves of books and so much of it was science fiction and fantasy. And my parents were okay with me just walking up to the shelves, finding a book I wanted, and said, "I want this one." That's how I ended up with my uh, my fir very first official science fiction book, which was "Have Spacesuit uh, Will Travel" by Robert Heinlein. Uh, oh my God, I, I that is my favorite Heinlein book of all time. And it sits on the corner of my desk right here. <laughs> I have lost. I've long since lost my copy, uh, much to my dismay. But it, I remember everything about the story. I, I did a book report for it in second grade, um, and that was the, the first. You know, the, 
my introduction to Heinlein, and then I just started reading everything Heinlein did. Um, the Moon is a Harsh Mistress, uh, you know, the, uh, the Star Beast, the, the Rolling Stones, uh, all the, you know, The Number of the Beast, which is still one of the most amazing uh, and I think subversive books he ever actually got into print. Um, and uh, from there, I just ended up reading everyone else that I could find. That's where I got the, um, uh, you know, there was a, uh, uh, books by uh, John W. Campbell, books by Frederick Pohl, books by uh, Robert Silverberg, who's one of my favorites, uh, Gregory uh, Bedford, who wrote um, The Time of the Great Freeze, one of my first awesome uh, Ice Age book finds. Um, and, the, the, and all of these guys really did uh, shape how I think about the world. Uh, Bedford in particular, like, once I found out he was an actual scientist, who was also a sci-fi writer, just encouraged me to learn more about uh, science as it was, rather than that it, how it appeared in, uh, in stories. And by the time I was you know, out of college, I'd realized, you know, there's a really fine line between trying to write hard sci-fi and trying to fake it and faking it works sometimes but the, the story is rather more important than that well, you you resort to using a lot of hand wavium you know throughout uh when, when you're faking it and sometimes <laughs> that works and sometimes it's not so much robert Robotech is interesting is that they've got an actual way that universe works and they're consistent with it. Um, right. So as long as you're consistent with it, you should be fine. Um, my early work, obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're a kid. You're not that consistent with everything and character is not really something you care that much about. Um, but once I actually sat down a few years ago and decided to write Article 9, which is my first – proper hard sci-fi uh title i said i'm going to do this right and it's going to be awesome and i don't exactly know how i'm going to do it but here's the thing um that book basically took two years of research both in libraries and in um and on the internet and it turns out that you can find some awesome resources that are produced uh, by NASA because basically all the research studies that they've done and find are available online if you just know where to look for it. And that's how I figured uh, – that's how I found the, uh, the, the results of the uh, Stanford Ames uh, study, which was done in 1973. And it's literally an instruction manual on how to build a space station. So what, <laughs> all I basically did was took that information, interpolated it into my own universe and put in and, – and, and made – up uh, uh, what I thought it was an interesting political um, state of affairs and uh, published it a couple of years ago. And yeah, people seem to think it's a good story. So, so what's the premise of that story? Um, it's about five or ten years in the future. A very large company uh, called Geosync Electric uh, Incorporated is they basically have built the market on solar space satellites to beam solar power onto a national grid. And different countries are buying different satellites, and the United States government is not terribly interested. And giving them a whole lot of business, relying mostly on coal, mostly on uh, nuclear and uh, you know fossil fuel fuels. And um, the way it comes, but the thing is, the one thing that the U.S. government wants is access to the space stations that this company has built and deployed over the over the uh, previous thirty years, because they can either get access to that by way of that uh, relationship, or they can repeat. You know, basically reverse engineer everything that the uh, company has done in order to put their own system up, and it's this constant tension between the U.S. Uh, military, really, and uh, and this company trying to figure out who is going to get access to the to those orbital resources. And into this, it's discovered that there are objects well beyond Pluto, out in the uh, uh, out in the solar system, that are transmitting messages to anyone who is willing to hear them, and that leads to even more tension between these two uh, these two powers and it becomes a race to the aliens as well as a race to the uh, to the resources there seems to be uh, well I'm, I'm gonna I want to ask you that question a little bit later uh, but I, I want to dial okay. back just for a second I, I was I was about to go uh, on a on a certain trail of thought but I'm gonna come back to that I before I before we get too far away I want to ask your opinion about something um 
I think it was Hugh Howey that I talked to uh, about a year ago on the show, and we were talking about uh, – because he and I are, are – close in age. I think I'm a little older than him. Um, I think I'm just a little bit younger than you, uh, though I think the three of us are in that window. You know, we're born in the 70s, uh, grew up, you know, I was born in 71. Uh, so, you know, a lot of my formative memories are in the 70s. Right. Uh, and then then my, you know, teenage adolescence is in the 80s. But, you know, that's very, that's a very particular time because we uh, had access to a lot of geekdom that was really coming into the mainstream, but we did not yet have the internet. So uh, I remember uh, when you wanted to find something, it was a real chore to find it. But when you found it, it was uh, like finding that that diamond in the rough. You know, you you really uh, you appreciated things that you found because you had to kind of dig for it. It wasn't just readily available. Um, Hugh didn't quite buy that. He he said, ah, you know, kids today, you know, they uh, they have other you know opportunities that we didn't have, and you know they'll look back and and say the same thing about the next generation. Uh, but as a, a kid that grew up really appreciating geekdom and, and nerdy stuff, uh, how do you think that was different for you than uh, maybe your kids that you're raising now? And uh, do you see that uh, that formation kind of happening differently for them? Um, boy, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think you guys are both right in your own ways. Um, I think that there is a certain immediacy to discovery by way of the internet that is yeah. difficult to replicate in, in a, a, a traditional library, for instance. Right. Um, on the other well, hand, your, your, yeah. your, your, uh, your comment about the bookstores earlier is what kind of triggered that thought. And because I remembered going to those stores and digging through the aisles and, uh, you know, and finding things. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it, it's uh, I, I go to I go to uh, to cons. Uh, WinterCon is uh, a very local one. They're only like a, a five minute drive away from us, and it's uh, every December. Um, nice. And a lot of the kids who show up there are are my kids' age, nineteen, twenty, twenty one, that sort of thing. And um, these guys are the con itself is populated by traditional artists, people who draw, people who sell comic books, people who you know individual uh, in, independent authors, things like that. And you, it's no big, uh, it's no big um, task to find kids who are willing to spend hours digging through the bins that the vendors bring with them. So clearly, there's that uh, they have the patience to go and find stuff that's old and find stuff that they're interested in. Um, what I noticed the uh, the internet going to use is for more is connecting with people that like the stuff that they do. Uh, um, what what I, I work in a you know I'm a librarian I'm an academic librarian at uh, at a college uh, downtown Manhattan. Most of what we teach our students is not that the stuff is out there, but it's how to figure out where the stuff they want might might lie, uh, because the internet is no less a complex place. As as your, you know, as uh, the New York Public Library, it's this giant sprawling institution that covers five boroughs. It's um, it's got literally billions of articles available to it. And even for professional librarians, if we don't know where something is, we have to go and ask someone who does. Um, so I, I would, I, I don't think, I, I think the the experience of discovery, the techniques are different, but I think the drive is pretty much the same. That's great. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, or yeah, not. yeah. I well, <laughs> you know, and uh, I I see my kids go through the the same thing, and they uh, they dig around and they they find uh, you know geeky things and and add ons to games and things like that, and, and I see that same kind of fire that I had. Um, you know, it's it's just different. Um, but uh, you know, we we all have the the tendency to kind of uh, romanticize our childhood and and things like that. Um, but uh, but back to Article Nine uh, for a minute. Yeah. Uh, the you put that out a couple of years ago. Two thousand thirteen, I believe. Yeah. Okay. No. Right. Uh, Two thousand fifteen. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. And and you said you did two years of research uh, leading up to that. That's uh, that's a big commitment that uh, I think a lot of people are not willing to undertake. 
it's a monster of a book. Uh, when I, when my, my, uh, my goddaughter was three, um, she, or four, she was very specific in that she wanted to go to outer space. And <laughs> for a couple of years, you know, you, you encourage that sort of thing, even though you understand that, <laughs> honey, there's no way you're going to qualify for the Air Force, much less the space program, but you can't tell them that. Right. Um, and if you, <laughs> even if you can tell them that, you let, you let them know there are ways to contribute. I mean, NASA is paying people to lie in bed for six months at a time. That's an awesome job, but you're going to, in order to test how the human body loses muscle tone in weightlessness and this is a study that's been going on for years um uh, mary roach when she wrote uh packing from our uh, did nothing but research onto astronautic training uh, from NASA archives and got really – here's the thing. NASA has its own television uh, channel. It's incredibly addictive and it's available to anyone with an internet <laughs> connection. <laughs> These are the things you figure out as you do this research. Um, um, I, I just you know, I figured it was going to be a, a hard science book. It's got to conform to a certain level of physical reality that we're used to. And I didn't really know a lot about the space program or astronaut training or even what kind of projects we've got going on already. And so a lot of that was just combing through um, records and uh, and articles and books and just trying to figure out what those good research sources were the the re, in, in fairness the, the research didn't take me two years to do i did that in a few months but trying to figure out how to trying to figure out how to work it all into one interesting story that that took a that took a while yeah uh there seem to be two divergent paths uh that have evolved in science fiction over the last uh couple of decades uh maybe uh where one path is uh we have a a hopeful future and the other path is kind of this uh post apocalyptic uh vein that is uh enormously popular as well um i think it they definitely uh you know convey two different uh outlooks and and maybe the way we uh hope and dream about the future um you know i i go back to my love of heinlein at an early age i think i found have spacesuit will travel in the maybe the third or fourth grade, and uh, that I, I say that's my favorite book of his. There, there are other books of his that I've enjoyed more and gotten more out of, but that was my first, so it it kind of has a special place in my heart. Uh, but I look back at some of those guys and I think, wow, um, I really miss uh, the days of where we were looking forward to something. Uh, instead of the stories where we're rebuilding because the worst of humanity has, <laughs> has kind of, you know, happened. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Am, am I the only one who, who thinks about those things? Um, one of the things that I did when I was doing the research for Article 9 was I made friends with a bunch of uh, engineers. And when you write from an engineering point of view, it's very different from writing from a social point of view. Um, and I came to learn that, like it or not, the physical world we live in has real limits to it. Um, there are social economic limits, mostly. Uh, there are limits to the amount of energy we can harness and from where. There are limits to... Uh, what kinds of uh, research we're going to be able to do because of the way research is funded in various uh, in various uh, countries. Um, but ultimately, I like to think that we have the ability to learn from our mistakes and fix things. We do this all the time on an individual level. We do this on with our families. We do this with our friends. We've all got people that... We know are reasonable and rational people who have an alarming tendency to get really crazy when they get into really big groups. <laughs> and it, it really – it doesn't help that we have become so polarized politically as a, as a society. You've got half the country insisting that one – you know, that – uh, that one way of living is, is right. You've got the other side insisting that their way of living is right. Neither side really wants to talk to the other or even acknowledge the other's existence. Um, so in, to answer your question, I think, 
where I look for the advancements, I'm not looking at the United States specifically. I tend to look towards Asia and Europe because um, those guys really do have a habit of thinking 5, 10, 20 years down the line. And so if I think if, any, if anything truly um, – truly revolutionary is going to happen in the way we live, it's probably going to come from there rather than here. On the other hand, Americans are really almost, you know, I can say ingenious at uh, figuring out ways to solve problems. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a deeply optimistic person, which is why I'm so damn cynical <laughs> when I turn up. <laughs> In every other situation, I, 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 I like to think every day that today is the day we solve all the problems. We work together. We figure th- we figured things out. We're going forward. And then I turn on CNN and I just start crying. And then I turn the CNN off and I go about my day. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've written both dystopian stuff and verily optimistic stuff, which is really funny. That's where the Apocalypse series comes in. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to get yeah. to that in just a minute, but um, the uh, uh, yeah, I, I I agree with you. I I I am a much happier person when I just don't watch the news. When when we can have a a broader uh, outlook and look farther down the road than uh, than what is immediately happening, um, I think it's easier to um, you know to to be more optimistic and look to the better angels of our nature to to borrow that phrase. I think uh, so. Yeah, uh, but then you get on Facebook and the news is shoved in your face, and uh, you know, anyway, I've, I've decided to try and wean myself off of Facebook at least on my my desktop and my laptop. We'll see how that well, works. Well, let me know how that works because <laughs> I keep trying. And you know, I get sucked back in. But um, uh, speaking of uh, political climates and and all of that, and no, I'm I'm not going where <laughs> some of the listeners might think I'm going. Uh, you wrote a fantastic. Go there, go there. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I think <laughs> yeah, people where I live probably would be surprised at what I think about things, and then some of my friends on the other side of the country would probably be surprised at what I think about things. So I just. Don't talk about those things. Um, but anyway, I, I've had those same conversations. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, we I, all do. I, yeah, I, I think most of the other sides are stupid, and I just, you know, um, the, the petty arguments really grate on my nerves. Uh, but you wrote this fantastic short story. Uh, you put it out several months ago, sometime last year. Uh, the politics of the apocalypse. Yeah. Or yeah, and. Um, I absolutely love that story. I think I, I mean, you had just put it up and I read it that day or the next day, I think. And, uh, I, I remember telling you that, that I just, I loved it. Um, tell me where that came from and what, uh, what kind of brought about that, uh, that story and, uh, just kind of tell me where it came from. Um, I read when it was still new. It's no longer new, but it's growing exponentially, and it's kind of terrifying that way. Um, the Left Behind books by Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye, and it's a. It's Wait, did an you att- read all of them? I read all twelve of those suckers. Yeah, because I am okay. that kind of masochist. Okay, um, and, and it's the it's the it's a for anyone you know who's been living in Iraq and does not know it's a fictionalized um description of the apocalypse according to a very specific evangelical uh point of view right um, and and the yeah. writing style is like literary jolly ranchers um if it's that good i mean jerry well, Jenkins, jerry jenkins is one of the most uh horrific writers i've ever dealt with if only because there are there are problems with details being lost. Characters jump in and then jump out again. Yeah. Um, I'm not even going to discuss the theology or the eschatology because we will literally be here all night, and I don't want to bore anybody. But right. I, I decided, why do the Christians get to have all the fun? Um, I'm <laughs> I, I'm I'm Jewish, and I have spent what. Yes, yeah. and I, I was, yeah, and I spent a considerable amount of time in Jerusalem <laughs> when I was uh, when I was much younger, because um, I have relatives who live there, and um, it Jerusalem is a fascinating place, both historically and um, and politically. Uh, it's been around for a very very long time. It's one of the oldest cities in the uh, in, in the Middle East. It has survived conquests and invasions. 
and political strife and wars that have been going on for you know, a few thousand years now. Um, it's so important that in Dante's um, Divine Comedy, uh, this the island of purgatory is directly opposite the side of the earth that Jerusalem is on. So, in order to get to purgatory, you go down through Jerusalem, you go to hell, you climb up towards purgatory, you keep climbing uh, further, you know, up until you get to heaven, and that's that was his vision of the uh, of the afterlife. And I'm thinking, okay, how do we take this setting and put it into terms that I would be able to work with? Because you know, my Armageddon is not going to look like anyone else's, and at the same time. I'm, those themes are absolutely essential towards um, imagining what you know, imagining the great you know, the biggest battle between good and evil. And so I basically say, let's take this real setting, let's take my ideas about how magic would work if it were a real thing, and combine those two. And um, and I, I I would like to think I, I tried to capture the soul of, of that whole conflict, and I I hope it worked. Um, you apparently think it did, so that's awesome. I'm good. My yeah, job, I, I, my job is I, done here. Yeah, I, I love it. I, I've told you before that that's one of my favorite things that you've done. That's uh, you know I'm a uh, a bit of an armchair theologian uh, myself, not really, but I, I I you know like to think I'm probably more educated than some. And I loved your uh, your fair handedness with the topic. I I thought it was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I do you ever plan to uh, delve back into uh, into that region or those topics again. Um, I have the kernel of an idea how to link a whole bunch of disparate universes that I'm working on. Um, there is a character in that story named Bat. He is, he is this tall purple dude with, you know, he looks vaguely demonic, but he's working for the, the side of, of, of good. And he runs a, um, a city that is in, uh, in cyberspace called Justice. And I, you know, Stephen King has his dark tower. All of his stories are connected through that dark tower, either implicitly or explicitly. I'm trying to do something similar with the city of Justice. And and it's going to be years before I figure out how to do that, although Just does appear and Bat does appear. In a, a short story I wrote a little while ago um, called uh, The City of Iron and Light, which was published in Samuel Peralta's uh, Feyland, uh, uh, Feyland Chronicle, you know, Future Chronicles Feyland, um, and based on um, Anthea Sharp's Feyland series. And so I'm slowly trying to figure out how to work these things together. Cool. Cool. Well, I uh, I would love to see it. Um, what do you do? Um, you also last year published a book uh, that was originally slated to be an apocalypse weird book, uh, The Taste Makers. Yeah. Uh, first, tell me a little bit how, about how you got involved in that project, and uh, I think we all know uh, kind of what what came of it. Uh, but one thing that I'm really appreciative. Uh, of that whole project is that I made a lot of great friends through that. Uh, and uh, a lot of us have remained uh, fairly close and have gone on to do uh, other joint projects and things like that and uh, have really supported each other. Uh, so no matter what came of Apocalypse Weird, I think some good stuff came out of it. But uh, tell us how you came to it and then where this book came from and uh, kind of how you took it uh, to your own. <laughs> That's a, it's a, a multi-part question so i'll give you a yes multiple, it is i'll give you a multi-part answer All right. um okay um i didn't know any of you guys at that time i had just um i was doing my own thing and trying to figure out how to uh make everything work and but i was friends with uh rob mcclellan who had done some web work for an author named michael r hicks and rob and i started talking and he one day posted me this link to to the apocalypse weird um um, the fanfic page because they were looking to do fan fiction stories in that universe and I didn't know who Nicole or Michael Bunker or all of these folks were but I found that but I, but I liked the idea behind the project and the rule of that particular contribution site was anybody can write anything it's third tier stuff you could do it it's fanfic do it and I said you know 
I could come up with something like this. And I, and I got to know a couple of the uh, – as, as I started talking to people, I got to know what a couple of the uh, authors were. Uh, Daniel Smith was one of them, and Daniel was looking to do the uh, New York City um, Apocalypse Weird book. And I – we started talking, and I got a hold of his story, and wait, he let me read it, obviously. And <laughs> – You yeah. snuck in and stole it. No, right? no. And um, – <laughs> Hmm, no, and and he basically was looking to do this this uh, the story that was all about Manhattan, and because you can't have a New York story without it being Manhattan, just people when people think of New York, they think of Manhattan. It's not fair to the other four boroughs, but it's true. Um, and Daniel, you know, eventually you know uh, left the program, which was cool, which meant that I was basically bumped up to the guy from New York who is contributing to this program now. Um, the trouble is the story that I had in mind would not work as a first tier story without a huge amount of, of, um, of re of of rethinking, and so I went um, to a slightly different direction. Um, where I see, and this is the second part of the of the uh, of your answer. Uh, uh, many many years ago, I used to work in downtown Manhattan. Ironically, very close to where I work now. And a lot of the guys that we were dealing with were what would now would be called finance bros, guys who worked on Wall Street, guys who worked in these giant buildings. Uh, I, at the time, was working in a, uh, a software store that was right across the street from Dexel Burnham Lambert, and that'll you know see if anyone recognizes that name anymore. Um, and that was during the the, you know, the big 1987 1988 crash. Everything got depopulated. All the big companies got emerged or went or bust anyway that that time kind of impressed on me just what that sort of thing is looking like but the thing is i didn't know how i could actually convert that into a story on its own so i'm thinking how do we start the apocalypse i know the, the apocalypse starts because of marketing and the whole thing <laughs> fell into place. I found out that Nick Cole was really into Guy Fieri. I can do something with Guy Fieri. And so my version of the 88 was a guy named Hunger. Hunger is not famine. Hunger is the desire for more. And hunger is never really satisfied. And hunger basically is using the main character and her firm to jumpstart the apocalypse by way of cursed steak knives he's merchandising us to our doom and that's about as that combines everything i know about that part of the city about how business works about my own experience doing public relations in college as an intern and um and i i, I actually think that's the best thing i've ever written so far <laughs> yeah it's fantastic um how 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 was it different for you uh, coming off of something like Article 9, which is hard science fiction and definitely goes uh, to hit all those uh, those buttons that, that we look for in, in science fiction? And then writing something that is uh, you know apocalyptic uh, but kind of urban fantasy and um, kind of the polar opposite of Article 9 uh, – how how were how is it for you as a writer shifting gears between those two things? Is that difficult, or is that just a you know just it's just a different story? So I just approach it differently. Um, Article nine didn't click for months and months and months after I started writing. I originally came up with three chapters, uh, the first three chapters of the book, which introduced the first you know, three principal characters, and then I put it away, and it sat in on my hard drive for 10 years and i didn't go back to it until you know relatively recently um julie meyer who's the main character of the tastemakers was in my head for about five years uh when i because i knew what her conflict was i just didn't know the setting that was it was going to happen in uh because her conflict was she has a bad day at work she goes into saint patrick's cathedral on fifth avenue and she has a conversation with uh jesus basically and when she comes to her senses as she thinks of them the statue of jesus is missing from the cathedral and there's this you know whole thing that goes on after that and i you know i was i i, I never wrote that book but i incorporated those ideas 
ideas into the tastemakers and basically just said, okay, here's how it's going to work. We've got clear indicators of the good guys. We've got clear indicators of the bad guys. And we've got a narrative that involves everything. Um, and that's basically where that went. I'm not sure if that that, that might have been a little bit too rambling for a, for a, a solid answer, though. No, uh, but uh, is it uh, is it different writing uh, futuristic uh, science fiction as opposed to uh, you know something kind of near future and very grounded like the Taste Makers? Do you have difficult approaching those two topics? Um, no, and I, I think that comes from all my years as, uh, as a gamer because I was both into fantasy games I'm a very uh, uh, very long uh, running uh, Dungeons and Dragons player uh, Traveler is strictly science fiction uh, 2300 is strictly post-apocalyptic that sort of thing Gamma World is of course you know nuclear wasteland a lot like Fallout now is um, it, to me as long as the story it makes sense and is, is grounded in a set of rules I'm okay with it one of the Easiest things. Uh, one of the one of the um, uh, things I find easy to do that a lot of writers uh, profess difficulty with is placing myself in someone else's universe and writing to type. I don't have a problem with that. In fact, in some ways, I prefer that than doing my own stuff because all the all the legwork has been done already. The shape of the story yeah. is there. I just need to fill it with something that's interesting. Yeah. And and having an established set of rules uh, is is very freeing. Actually, uh, having some some boundaries to work within uh, it, it that seems uh, you know that seems kind of opposite of what you would think. But it, it's actually kind of comforting to to have someone hand you a set of rules and say, you know, here are your guidelines. That and uh, if there is a if there's an established canon, it's it's much simpler to simply come up with an idea and then ask the canon, uh, does this work? And if so, why? Or and if it doesn't work, what is that? Why not? And they have a definitive answer: yes, this works because A, B, and C. No, this doesn't work, but you can make it work by doing D, E, and F. It, right. it's, it, there's a bit of engineering to it, but I, it, it's a puzzle. I like puzzles. Yeah. And and you actually have a new book uh, that's about to come out uh, in a, about a week or so after this uh, this episode airs. Uh, but before we get to that, I want to ask you a question. I like to ask authors about this because I get um, uh, a lot of different authors use uh, place as a uh, a very tangible uh, part of their story. Sometimes it even becomes it seems like it becomes a character in the book and uh, like in the taste makers uh it's a it's a very new york book i mean obviously uh but it, how do you feel about uh could you write a book placed in the uh in the midwest or um you know or is is when you're writing this sort of thing is is new york going to kind of just come out I do seem to come back to New York over and over again. Um, I, Jerusalem was easy because I had spent a lot of time in Jerusalem. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I The Midwest, it's not fair and it's not right. But to me and to pretty much everyone else who has lived in this giant city our whole lives, we tend to think of the Midwest as being this flat place a lot like you know any suburbia that we would see. And it's not – again, it's not true. It's not fair and it's not right. But that's the image that we've got. Right. Um, it, 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 it wanna, if I want to write a book about Cleveland, I'd have to go to Cleveland and spend a couple of weeks there just to see what everything is like. I don't think I'd trust myself to do anything else. And I think the proof of that is the fact that I wrote this one New York book, and then I wrote another New York book right after it uh, called Digital Idols, which is also taking place in New York City. Uh, so I, they say write what you know, and in my case, I don't seem to feel comfortable writing unless I know a subject really, really well. Yeah. Do you, do you ever find yourself, uh, you know, every every place, every city, region has little little things that make it its own and sometimes it comes with colloquialisms or uh, you know kind of little inside baseball that only makes sense to people that live there uh do you ever find yourself using those sorts of things and then think you know i need to dial that back a little bit because someone in topeka kansas or in sacramento is just totally not going to get that 
Yeah, I, I try to keep a sense of humor with, with my book, and I put a lot of yeah. jokes in, and I take most of them out <laughs> over the course of an edit, <laughs> because you know, there's no way anyone is going to get this except for me, and I think it's funny, but you know, it, it's not really fair to be dragging everyone through my subconscious quite that uh, <laughs> uh, quite that uh, explicitly. Um, I, I do try to listen to people when they talk. Um, students, people you know, next to me when I'm waiting for the bus in the morning – um, language. I'm good at languages. I've learned a bunch of them in, in my life, even though I don't use uh, most of them most of the time. Um, uh, let's see. So, in terms of colloquialisms, that's more complicated. Uh, I wrote a story um, about that took place in Australia for another anthology that is, you know, a future project, and I showed it to one of the few Australians I know, and they basically said, "Okay, this is good. The story is fine, but you got to cut back this, that, and that because that's really racist where we come from." And I, I didn't know that that was a thing. I was just speaking of it in, in those terms, and. So so yeah, having people you can ask about that is an extremely valuable resource. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, you know, living in the the internet age now, uh, it, it's so easy to get some direct you know, input and feedback from someone who might actually know. Uh, you uh, you've mentioned. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, when we were growing. Up. The only Australian anyone any one of us had ever heard of was Paul Hogan and maybe Mel Gibson. <laughs> right. um, and, and now a phone call to Australia costs like fifteen cents. And right. there's 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 all kinds of people that from all over the world on the internet, you know, through uh, and, and a great manner of social media. It, the the resources are there for the taking. I find that endlessly fascinating and a little bit intimidating to be totally honest. Because what happens if something goes horribly wrong and we suddenly lose this vast resource we're we're not only one step back we're several steps back because we because we're trusting this technology with so much of our daily uh of, of our daily business you know the one of the big problem with libraries now is that we don't rely on print volumes anymore we rely on electronic books and if a vendor cuts us off we're kind of screwed and this is the sort of thing that librarians think of as they develop their collections well, I've never thought of that, and uh, I was about to ask you a minute ago uh, about your your day job. Uh, you are a librarian. Um, how does that influence what you do? Uh, how does it affect your writing? Uh, and what does it uh, does it does it make you a bit of a, uh, a literary snob? Um, my mother is an enormous literary snob, and when I was I said in, that with my tongue firmly in my cheek. I, I get that. I, yeah, I, yeah. I take no offense. Um, okay. I, I try not to be a snob. I've got – my parents were always dismayed at, at, uh, at during my uh, formative years that I liked – what they considered really lowbrow uh, things to read. You know, I, I was a comic book fan. They, to this day, don't know exactly why. And yet, comic books led me to the Sandman series by Neil Gaiman, which has in actually Neil Gaiman's Sandman books um, inform a great deal of what I do with uh, with my fantasy work when I actually write that. Oh yeah, uh, that's me where, too. Yeah, me too. And um, and and so and. Yeah. There are no bad books. Gaiman's right about that. There are books that we are ready for when we're ready for them. There are books that we are never ready for. There are books that we um, that we pursue because they're easier than you know. We want something familiar. Um, but I, I I try to I, I I try to encourage my students to read any. Thing. I don't really care what it is. Uh, we have a subscription to People Magazine in the uh, in the library, just so that they can have the experience of pulling a magazine off the rack and leafing through it for twenty or thirty minutes and putting it back. That's not that's not something everyone has access to, and it's something we take for granted. And I would appreciate, I would hope that we we stop taking these things for granted because they're they're really important to how we communicate with each other and how we derive information from the world of um, from the world of print, really. I, I've never thought that uh, that libraries uh, were going digital, and that that uh, it was getting harder and harder to um, uh, to depend on print volumes. That's uh, that's something that's just kind of escaped me, I guess. It's not something most people don't spend a lot of time in libraries, mostly because they don't have the time uh, to do it, and they figure that everything is on the internet. Um, 
specifically, you know, even our administrators say, well, we don't need a library because we have Google. But they it, they miss the important truth that Google is not a search engine. Google is an ad delivery service disguised as a search engine. And yeah, and you can pay your way to the top of the list if you have enough money for that. Um, Google is useful. It's got a lot of stuff to recommend it. But like Wikipedia, it's not the be all and end all of library searching. We we spend a lot of time and effort to um, to curate our collections. We care very much about them. Uh, our school has a very specific set of needs, and so we tend to play to those needs first. Um, and then you've got people who just don't get that because that's not how their minds work. Their minds work by solving problems, and sometimes problems can't be solved that quickly or easily. Um, as a writer and as a librarian, uh, what would you tell other writers uh, who maybe are in a situation where they really need to do some deep research and they're expecting to just pull up Google and, and find everything they need? Um, what would you tell them uh, about using the the library resources that may, that they may have at hand uh, to do better research and uh, to hopefully make their uh, their project better in the end. I can say this with a fair amount of confidence: no matter what topic you want to write about, someone else has already written about it at length. Your only job is to find that person, read what they wrote, and see how it helps you along on your path to whatever you're trying to produce. Um, there are literally billions of books on this planet. We have access to a small fraction of them. And uh, Google now has the ability to peruse um, scholarly sources. Google, Google Scholar is basically all about that. And they've made it their business to digitize all the scholarly books they can find. They've done, they've done a really, really impressive job with it. Um, but there's no substitute for sitting down with a, a, a volume, a tome, a thing you hold in your hands because that pra the practice of reading that book is going to help you concentrate for long periods of time. It's going to help you digest information better, and you're going to remember more of what you've read as you take notes. Google can't do that for you. Right, right. So people use your library and uh, and go visit your librarian. Meet them uh, <laughs> and form a relationship with them. They're there to help you. For Pete's sake, um, you we're have really new, very friendly people. That's that's what you say, but we'll, we'll <laughs> let we'll let the listeners determine that for themselves. Uh, okay. We're joking. We're joking. Yeah, um, you have a new project that's just about to drop, uh, and this is another science fiction uh, project. Tell us about this new book that's about to come out. Well, I don't want to say too much, a eh, because the book. Book, as I said a little uh, earlier in the show, was uh, is at the editor now, and I have sent a copy to the uh, the primary um, holder of the IP for a canon check, and so things may change the, substantially. But uh, in a word, it's uh, it's. Uh, it's it take it's a legacy fleet book. It takes place in Nick Webb's legacy fleet universe, and um, it is about a planetoid monitor which is designed to be the last refuge of defense uh, for the for Earth's solar system as the rest of the legacy fleet is off fighting the aliens in the in another part of the galaxy. Awesome, uh, and that's <laughs> going to be at the end of January. End of January, yes. Awesome, awesome. Uh, we will uh, we'll definitely send everybody over to go pick up a copy of that when it comes out. I've uh, I've read uh, David Brun's Legacy Fleet book. I've read Chris Porto's Legacy Fleet book. Both of the both of those were fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, I'm looking forward to see what you do with the uh, with the world. It's a lot of. It was a lot of fun to write. Um, it most a lot of it came to me at the. Uh, how do we describe this? At the well, at the last minute. I, I this thing clicked a few weeks ago, and I just blew out two thousand words a day for like weeks to get it done. Um, because I, you don't want to mess up the schedule. You want to make sure that there's enough time to get everything in order. I've got uh, Tom Edwards doing the cover for it. He does the covers for all of the of, of these books, and they're all amazing. Um, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing how people react to this. 
Yeah, I I love it when when it comes alive like that, and uh, when it like you said it clicks. Uh, and there's there's just no substitute for that. You know, some books you you slave away at, and you you kind of chip away at it until you mold it into something. And other things, uh, it's just like a movie, and you're just struggling to take notes uh, and to describe what's happening, you know, in your brain. Uh, so I love it when that happens. I think I'm getting better at it too because um, I've been doing this indie thing for three years. Um, one book the first year, two book the second year. Hugh Howie on one of his blog posts said that if you can do 500 words a day you can crank out two books a year so that's my goal two books a year until i can figure out a way to do more than that um i've already got the second article line of book uh done I, it, it just needs to be processed and and with some editing and i've got a 35,000 40,000 word outline for the third book in that series uh, you know i've gotten some work done on the second xpocalypse book which is going to take which is again going to take place in the, in New York because that's my thing, and uh, I I really think I'm getting the hang of this because uh, they're just I've got so many awesome friends, contacts, and just resources that are being happily shared in the uh, the indie um, self publishing community, and uh, I don't really think I'd be able to do any of this without that. That's great, and uh, yeah, there's there's so many good things that have come out of this uh, this indie author thing, and uh, uh, great friendships, great uh, great books that we've we've been exposed to. Um, it's it's just a great time. Uh, John, tell everybody where they can find your work and uh, kind of keep in touch with you. And uh, do you do you have a website? Uh, the website is John Frater, J O N F R A T E R dot thirdscribe dot com. That's got access to pretty much everything I've done so far. I haven't updated the blog in a while. I need to do that <laughs> soon, and I, I will absolutely post the uh, the drop the, all the information you're going to need um, there. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm around. Um, so anyone who wants to find me can do so relatively quickly. Awesome. Uh, thanks for coming on the show, John. I've had a great time talking with you. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks again, Hank. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Join me each Tuesday and Friday at hankgarner.com for a new episode. Thanks for listening. <laughs>